We have uh, in studio all week long as the co-host, the mogul, Michael Hornby. Good to see you, Delegate. Good morning, Rob. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure. Second time this week. He is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He is the executive director of the Berkeley County Health Department before he quits soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Kearns. Tough audience in here. <laughs> have to add that quitter thing well, yeah, he's, he's calling it retirement. Can we retirement. On, can we put it on the co-host slash quitter? Slash quitter. Yeah. Yeah. Colin, can you yeah. add that to Bill's <laughs> title? Co-host slash quitter? <laughs> Colin says money. Just give me some money. I'll do anything you yeah, want. Whatever it takes. Now, Bill, when did you first decide that you were a quitter? <laughs> what did this descend upon you? When I first decided well, I was going to retire? You? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm younger than Rob. Yeah. <laughs> most people are now. This right. is one of those parts in your life where you realize that, that most people are younger than you. Yeah. After um, How many years have you put in? Um, 30 so years. 30 years. 30 years, years. yeah. So, okay. um, that's one of the great benefits of starting young in, in public health with the state uh, retirement system. At a point, you at, any, at 55, you could actually actively look at retiring, wow. or as Rob says, quitting. Quitting is the actual word. Yeah, yeah. but... Uh, that's just there. because Rob doesn't have those great benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hornby gives me many great benefits. Yeah. One, I get to hang out with him during the course of the day. Do you get to do and, that? And that's no. it. That's the only benefit. <laughs> and, and he's a lot nicer to you after he has to deal with that keyboard for a couple of days. Well, this is, uh, as I've said before, I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. Many people have tried to host their own talk shows at home, and it is not going well. It's because I am a paid professional. You have been doing it for a while. A day or two. Yeah. Our guest in this segment is uh, one of the folks who uh, podcasts on the OAN Network. Good morning uh, to uh, Mike Allers, Jr., who previously was a candidate for the House of Delegates in the Republican primary for the 99th. That's the seat that uh, Delegate Wayne Clark holds. It was uh, a three-way race there in the primary that uh, Wayne came out on top with there, and Mike Allers, Jr. was one of those challengers. Mike, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good to be here. How are things at the house this morning? Things are things are great. I got a newborn, so she's uh, she's all smiles this morning, which is great. So she's not cranky. Oh, yeah, I don't hear any noise through the night. Oh yeah, no, she's <laughs> it is completely perfect. So she's sleeping now. She sleeps through the night. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Wow, it's completely different than my son. So <laughs> I'm I'm thanking God. Yeah, good for you, man. That's wonderful. Congratulations. I Thank think it's you so much. I think it's the second one you just ignore more. You think they sleep through the night, but you actually just sleep through the night. You know what? Maybe that's it. <laughs> that's, that's what happened turn, with my Turn that monitor off. And when they get, well, I didn't hear them. <laughs> I'll be there in the morning. My, my first, we, we, I woke up every you know, 40 minutes. Did he move? Did he move? The second one, I was like, yeah, honey, you got this. I'm going oh, bad. Technology <laughs> nowadays, they have monitors yeah. you put on their ankles. It tells right. you what their temperatures are, what their breathing is like, and the room temperature. Oh, so advanced. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that what they so do with home there. confinement prisoners? Yeah, too. Bill? Yeah. So this sends there? it to your phone that you can just keep with you to tell if that newborn is breathing at nighttime. And I, I don't know about you, Mike, but when, when both of the mics and Bill, when, when our first one was born, I couldn't believe that they just let us take a baby home from the hospital with the, no training. No instructions. Do what no, do I do no, with no this car thing? seat, no book. <laughs> I can't yeah, even take care I, of myself. You, you know, I, I think a lot of teen pregnancies would be reduced if you were, as a teenager, like allowed to just watch the whole thing. Yes. Because oh, they, they literally hand you the baby, they say, here you go, and uh, it's up to you. Yeah. And it's, it's completely scary, and it doesn't matter what age you are. That's so, the truth. Oh, like a scare them straight program, kind of like the sheriff's 100%. program. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, what is it, the lockdown show? Yeah. Only with uh, childbirth. Yeah, <laughs> think, think of all the things in life that you have to have training for before they let you do it. And then, then they just give you a baby. Just here, take, you've been in the hospital a day. Here, it's yours. Take it home. Take it home. <laughs> what do I do with it? I don't know anything about this. Figure you've it out. Like two hours of sleep. Yeah, You're, you'll be. That's sleep a luxury. Trying try, try to get this kid figured out. So, uh, Mike, obviously, uh, child rearing is not the reason why we invited you on the show, though. Your perspective on it has been appreciated, sir. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> tell me about the OAN uh, network and the podcast that you do. What is this about? Actually, uh, at, at OAN, I am a, I'm a writer and a producer. Um, I, I formerly have a podcast, but I actually I, I do opinion pieces for them online. And it's really, really great. Uh, they're, they're able to have me share my perspective um, you know, from the populist right. I am writer and producer for the 
show Fine Point with Chanel Rion. You might have known her from, remember, she was uh, the OAN White House correspondent during the Trump years. She now has her own show. So I am her writer, I'm her producer, and we actually package her show also for podcast form. Um, I do contribute sometimes in a segment where mm -hmm. my face is on camera, but I am behind the scenes this time, uh, as well as writing my own opinion pieces for the website. Okay, and, and tell us about the OAN website and its, its uh, purpose and its political persuasion. Sure. Well, look, what, what American News, I think, is incredibly important uh, to the conservative movement and for the conversation. You know, a, a lot of the time you just get lost with Fox and even Newsmax now. One American Network is kind of the third way. It's, uh, it's more populist, I would say. It uh, certainly has a pro-Trump flavor. Um, and we are, we are proudly pro-Trump, uh, most of us at the network. And I think that's incredibly important for the conversation and the conservative movement. I think there's a lot of different flavors to the conservative movement and to the Republican Party under Trump. And I think that's the opportunity for that big tent. And uh, One American Network is certainly one of the temples. You know, it's an interesting statement because uh, I've been a registered Republican since Ronald Reagan. And I can't mm -hmm. remember a time when I think the Republican Party has been less tolerant than it is now. And I'm not just talking about minority views. I mean, about other sure. Republicans within the Republican Party. Uh, I, don't, I can't think of another time when there's been more rhino accusations, people saying they're going on <laughs> rhino hunting expeditions that have nothing to do taken, with big game. Me, taken from me, guys, as a, as a, um, as a candidate, I was hit with that like right out the gate. So they're like simply if you challenge anybody, you're considered a rhino. If you decide to have maybe if you're 90% locked in with somebody on the views and you have one different view, you are considered a rhino. So I completely understand. One of, at One American News, we, are, we like to have a wide range of perspectives. I think that's important especially when it comes to the Republican Party and the conservative movement, because you are right, Rob. Like, if you're a traditional Reagan Republican, you shouldn't be chased out of the party. Even if you like George Bush, you shouldn't be chased out of the party. Um, we're allowed to have these different views, and with, with changing at the times comes different views and different solutions. Yeah, I, I just I find the party to be more, it's a Trump party as opposed to a Republican party, and if you're not 100% in lockstep with Donald Trump and everything he says and does, then you're a rhino and you're not welcome. Yeah, and, and, and that's unfortunate, because I really don't think that should be the case, because, you know, I think we should, whether we're at a news network, whether we are voters, I think we should hold everybody accountable, and you should always call balls and strikes, whether it's President Trump or whoever is our standard bearer. Uh, let's uh, preview this debate coming up between uh, Vice President Harris and former President Trump in just a, a few days here. Uh, Mike, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see this, and what do you think uh, each candidate has to do to put themselves over the top in this debate? Sure. So uh, as we know now, it's going to be the same exact rules as the CNN. So the silent mics, I don't believe there's an audience. Um, and obviously that, uh, that sunk Biden's ship. Uh, Kamala is a completely different <clears throat> candidate. And I think it's a mistake to underestimate her. Unfortunately, a lot of people, um, you know, especially like conservative Twitter spaces, Call her an idiot, call her, you know, uh, you know, she's chief of word salads, all these things. She was still a prosecutor, and she is plenty capable. And if you actually look at her debate performance, she might not know how to speak off the stump or at a campaign rally. But against Mike Pence, I, I would argue she was formidable. Against Biden in 2020, I would think she was formidable. So I definitely think Trump cannot go in there overconfident or appearing to look dismissive towards her because she is kind of a, a democratic bear trap uh she is a woman she's a woman of color and those those things are definitely they can bring out uh wrong impulses and i think it's very very important that trump not only shows restraint i think he's able he needs to prosecute the case and out prosecute her as to why he should be reelected. michael Delegate Michael Hornby. And it can, doesn't have to be about the debate. It can be about anything. Well, I think you know, my take on the debate is you know, Kamala was the first one out against Biden. So I, I, I know she was definitely – she did debate pretty well, uh, and she was very formidable against uh, Biden in the debate. But um, 
to me, it, it's one of those things where, as long as Trump can keep his calm and do what he did in the uh, in the uh, first debate with Biden, I think he can uh, he can hold his own. Um, I think the muting of mics helped a lot. I, I think it helped him, right? Yeah, you can't. Yeah. 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 Well, and he made the mistake the first time around, a lot of people thought, of not letting Joe Biden answer questions back in 2020. He kept interrupting him, and a lot of people thought that that actually saved Joe Biden during those debates. Because you remember Biden in 2020, in that race, he disappeared for several months. He went well, away. For, and Kamala's going to do the same thing. Right? She's not doing interviews, things like that. To me, it, it's if to me Trump lost because of the... Uh, pandemic that that mm -hmm. daily uh press conference that he did just ruined him it, it, it really didn't mm -hmm. didn't help, didn't help in, him in any. any way shape well the economy was in great shape it was humming along and it's difficult to defeat a president who's an incumbent when the economy is great so right. i i think it would have been he'd have been a very hard out had there not been a pandemic yeah uh, no question about that Absolutely. Uh, I think the uh, biggest hurdle right now is Trump needs to get over the name calling and 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 stick to policy and talk about what he wants and and the policies that we need to have as a country and stop with the name calling. No, that'll never. Well, happen. And, and especially every time Republicans, it doesn't matter who it is, any Republican, if we are questioning, um, I think her qualifications or her race, I think that's a losing issue. Um, and, and it's insulting, and I don't think we should go down that road, uh, especially because the most vulnerable thing about her is her record. We do not need to make it personal. We don't need to attack her, her looks or whatever. Um, it's her policies, and her vice presidential pick, I think, does her more damage than even her own record. That guy's terrible. And her economic plan, uh, I mean, price price fixing i mean that could, price controls yeah. price control that is her economic plan if you just go back and look at that would it, it's almost socialism well yeah uh, mike i want to ask you you mentioned that we don't need to mention you know we don't make any comments about her appearance or whatever the fact mm -hmm. that this is what's troubling to me in, in how we've devolved the, the fact that in 2024 we have to urge that of the Republican nominee for president. I, I can't even begin to tell you the ridiculousness of needing to urge somebody in 2024 to not make racial comments about your opponent. That shouldn't even have to be something that's on the checklist. All right, we're getting him ready for the debate. What do we need to make sure he doesn't do? Oh yeah, don't make any racial comments. How is that even on the checklist in 2024? It's, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I really, I think, I think I chalk it up to, um, you know, not to generalize, but I really think I, I chalk it up to generational styles and differences. Um, I think at one time that would have played uh, if we were talking 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it certainly does not now. And uh, those moms, whether it's moms, whether it's college educated voters in the suburbs of Philadelphia or DeKalb County in Georgia, they're going to be turned off by that. Um, and, and rightfully so. And I think President Trump has really remained focused. I think he should actually take a page out of his old ex-friend uh, or now friend of me, Chris Christie. Now, when Chris Christie was way ahead in 2013 and he had a challenger, Barbara Buono, um, who, you know, he was going to win anyway after Hurricane Sandy. But during the debate, he was not combative Christie. He showed restraint. He even complimented her a few times. And he just kind of kept it focused on him, almost ignored her, and just talked about his own record. Um, and whenever he would go to her, she would go on the attack towards him, and he would be complimentary and keep it going. I think Donald Trump should take the same approach. I don't think he can. I don't think it's in his DNA. I don't think he's going to allow it to happen. And even at his, at his rallies, he said, I've been nice, you know, since after the assassination attempt. He, he said, what do you think uh, he's, to his crowd? Do I need to go back to being mean and name calling? They're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we want. And, and that's what he does is the crowds that go to his rallies and his base of supporters seem to love that stuff. So what the hell? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think we all want a fighter, right? I think it just depends what we're fighting for. Yeah. And right now we have to be fighting uh, about the economy for the economy. I mean, especially after that assassination attempt, like that was, you know, Trump, the winds of Trump's back 
after that. And we cannot squander this opportunity and we cannot slouch and we cannot say, we can't say, oh, it's going to be rigged. We have to keep it completely focused um, and, and not underestimate her and not discount that, yeah, Georgia's going to be in play. Michigan especially is going to be in play. And this isn't going to come easy. And we need a turnout majorly. Absolutely. Republicans need to turn out this election. This, this is too important. Um, we need to get out the vote. Make don't doesn't matter what state you're in. Get out your vote, Mike. Uh, what do you see as the the down ballot effect of this uh, ticket right now? I understand, and listening to some of the reports this morning, Harris obviously has raised a ton of money since mm-hmm. she became the the uh, the nominee, and uh, even before the election, um, before the convention for the Democrats, uh, the money started to flow in. And I'm hearing now that's really starting to help the down ballot races because they're raising so, so much money. They're directing it into those uh, those campaigns now. Are you having any thoughts as to who you think ultimately winds up with the Senate and the House at the end of this? Uh, well, that's the thing. I actually think uh, I think we are a nation of checks and balances, and I, I don't think it's going to be a clear sweep. So if it is, let's say, a Trump victory, I think it's very, very possible, even though historic, historically it really hasn't happened. I think it's possible that the Democrats can win the House because there is a energy in these kind of swing districts that ha- – like there's energy that's been revitalized on the ground where – like – states in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, where there's these crucial House seats, even in New York, that could, uh, I'm originally from Long Island, that seat is now in play, New York's first district, um, that could easily flip. So even if Kamala doesn't make it across the finish line, the Democrats could still win the House. I don't, we have a very slim majority, what is it, like three, four seats. Um, it's, incre- it's entirely possible that we could have a Trump presidency, Democratic House, uh, Right now, the Senate, I would have said three weeks ago, the Republicans are going to win the Senate. Obviously, we pick up with West Virginia. However, Pennsylvania is going to be uh, kind of a tougher get. Uh, Dave McCormick is an incredible candidate, but Bob Casey is a Pennsylvania institution. And now Pennsylvania is far closer now than it was when it was Trump versus Biden. So I, and, and right now in Ohio. Um, Bernie Moreno right now is like behind, I think it's like double digits in polling to Sherrod Brown. Uh, and it's possible the Democrats still hold Ohio. So I, I think right now, I, I think it is possible Republicans could win the Senate, but I think definitely we'll lose the House. Could you have a repeat of this in Alaska is two different ways. Trump loses the popular vote, wins the Electoral College, but Harris has to win the popular vote to win the Electoral College. Do you agree with those possibilities or those statements? 100%. 100%. I think Kamala has to win the popular vote by like three or four points to, to win the Electoral College. And it's going to come down to Georgia is in play. Michigan is very important. Uh, President Trump must win Pennsylvania. Um, if he does not win Pennsylvania, then he has to pick a, you know, he has to secure Nevada. Nevada hasn't gone Republican since 2004, right? right? And he has to pick up a few other states along the way, like New Hampshire, right? right? In order to make up for Pennsylvania. Uh, but Pennsylvania is crucial. Kamala's campaign is going all in on Georgia. So that's something that we have to watch. And if we look at 2022, um, Herschel Walker did not make it across the finish line. Georgia is very much a purple state trending blue uh, because of the Atlanta suburbs. Virginia, I believe, has gone blue the last four presidential elections. Is there a chance that it comes back to Trump? Uh, I mean, I I lived in Virginia a long time. I don't think so now. I think under Biden, Virginia is kind of fool's gold, right? Even if it is close, the northern Virginia suburbs, I was just driving down there this weekend. uh, Sorry. This past weekend. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Harris signs, wall signs. I haven't seen Harris signs and wall signs anywhere. I've seen actually one in Charlestown, just one. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen them anywhere else except Northern Virginia. So you have Northern Virginia, you have the Richmond suburbs. Those are blue. And quite frankly, um, this is kind of Governor Youngkin's fault. Um, He has not gotten to do enough as governor to make sure that uh, the Republicans, you know, have delivered anything in Virginia. So there really isn't for those swing voters an incentive to even vote Republican. Yeah, he lost his because House and Senate, done. right? They're, they're both blue? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it, he, it, he dropped the ball there. 
Mike Allers Jr. is our guest. He was a candidate in the Republican primary for the House of Delegates 99th back in May, a, a member of the OAN uh, network and uh, joining us via telephone for our guest slot in this first segment of the nine o'clock hour. Mike, your thoughts on West Virginia politics, having been exposed to it as a candidate for the first time, and uh, yeah. I presume something that you'll try to pursue again in the future. Oh, uh, one hundred percent. I mean, this uh, this time wasn't my best go around. Obviously, you know, with, with the baby, there was a lot of you know family things that I had to juggle, and it was definitely stressful as uh, as a candidate. Um, but I definitely, I'm not going to give up. Uh, I think West Virginia is important to be fighting for. Um, I am looking forward, uh, to a, uh, to making West Virginia fully red with Jim Justice getting elected to the Senate, Patrick Morrissey getting elected governor. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. And, um, this is why I, I'm going to remain active in the fight. Republicans, I know the governor is going to call a special session. We should never get comfortable just because this is a red state. Um, doesn't mean we've won anything. We are 50th in every category, in education, in healthcare, in infrastructure. And these are terrible. And uh, by me, they're building 6,000 new homes, right? And my worry is if the Republicans do not put some serious W's on the board, and we have people moving from Northern Virginia, Maryland, in maybe like four years, uh, the West Virginia 2nd District could easily go blue. Easily, if we don't deliver these wins. Do you think the people moving here are more Democrats or Republicans? Because my my thought is they're they're mostly Republicans moving to to West Virginia. Am I wrong there? Well, the people in my neighborhood um, are are very young. They're in their 30s, and most of them are are independent. Basically this. A lot of them are independents that might be right-leaning but do not like Trump. And I think if you get enough of those voters in – and Republicans are not delivering wins, especially on, a, on education, which I believe as a former teacher is our most important issue, back to prosperity in West Virginia. Uh, a lot of those voters will be in play, I think, with the right candidate. So West Virginia has to watch it. I think you're right, Mike. Um, and I'm one of the poll workers that have been since the middle 90s. And I see a lot of people coming in anymore. And it's a drastic increase in people that come in and identifying as independents. Yes, and, and on top of that, what also worries me, we are ranked um, we are ranked the top state for like lowest turnout in our voting. I think that's a problem. That means people aren't motivated enough. That also means whether it's our delegates or state senators, um, it's unfortunate, uh, especially running in a primary. You would think that after a primary, the winner of that primary would, you know, try to unite the party or make efforts to continue the campaign. Once these people win the primary, they go away. You never see right. them. They put up one sign and just expect the coast to victory. That's a problem. And, and, so I definitely plan to be back in this thing. And us in the Eastern Pan are the worst of the worst in the state. We have the worst turnout. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but, I mean, the whole the, the statewide races awful. could have changed if we had, had 50% turnout. But I don't think you can get too confident when we're talking about people moving into our area right. and the drastic increase in population. I don't think we can get too confident that these people are not going to come in and change that color. Right. Well, I think Mike exactly. brings up a good point. Hey, Mike, I, we're, we're actually out of time. i got to cut you off here. So if you have a quick okay. thought, I'll give you 15 seconds if you can wrap it up in that way. Sure. 15 seconds. We just have to remain vigilant. We have to do our turnout. A lot of these people don't even know what the House of Delegates is or the state senate is. So we have to do our job, and if we don't get turnout, we're not doing our job well enough. Mike, so good, thank you for having me on, Robin, guys. Good to talk with you. Thank you, Michael.